So the first talk this morning that I'm going to give is about one of my least favorite complaints, which is back pain. And let me tell you why I find this complaint to be a bit frustrating. Because I feel like I have so little to offer most of the time. Does anyone else feel that way? Someone comes in with back pain and we know right from the moment they hit the door, odds of them having something very dangerous is very low. Most patients are going to be fine. Most patients are not going to have something serious and they're just going to get better on their own taking a medication that they probably already took or have in their home. So I feel like, well, what did I really offer here? You know, I like the things that I can fix. Give me an abscess, yes. I love to cut into an abscess. I love to fix a problem. Back pain is not one that we can generally fix. So I have to remind myself, and if you're like me, then I'll remind you that this is something that we are incredibly valuable at and we are, very, we are offering something very important. It's not just saying, you're going to be fine, go home and take some ibuprofen, it's going to get better on its own. That's true. But we offered our expert assessment, evaluation, and recommendations, and that reassurance. So I'm going to try to do a little paradigm shift here. If you're frustrated by back pain, let's keep that in mind. That is what we were offering. And the subtitle of this lecture is Don't Miss the Red Flags. That's the key thing with back pain. We're going to see so many patients with back pain. And, and most of them, like I said, are fine. Our job is the needle in the haystack to find the ones that are not going to be fine. And so we're going to lump these into this red flag category as we move forward. We're going to talk about these red flags. These are the things that you're going to want to assess for in every single patient who comes in with back pain. So we think about the back, okay? We've got the muscles, the vertebral column, we've got the spinal cord. There's so many different places that the pain could be coming from. And then I should really add a fourth image here, which is a big question mark, because sometimes we don't actually know where the pain's coming from or why it's happening. It's a very common reason for patients to present to us, only second to upper respiratory tract infections. In most patients, it's not even gonna have a specific diagnosis. And this is patients who are, I'm gonna say young because I fall into this category of the 30 to 45 year olds, right? So young patients, this is oftentimes when they get that first episode of back pain. I just had my first episode last week. Let me tell you, not very fun. It's the most common cause of work-related disability and a very common cause of disability overall. Patients may or may not even have risk factors. They could just be coming in with just this new onset of back pain. And here's the good news. Most of the time, it's gonna go away all on its own, but it might take a few weeks. And adding that piece of advice to when you counsel your patients, that's the part that's a little bit frustrating. Hey, you're gonna be fine. Just give it two months. Oh, thanks, doctor. I'll just go home and take ibuprofen for two months. So let's think about what's that differential of the etiology of back pain. It can be mechanical, which can come from degenerative disc disease, facet joint deterioration, muscle spasms, ruptured or bulging discs. It could be traumatic. It could be an injury, a sprain, a strain, a fracture, acquired disorders, and then the things we really don't want to miss here, infections and tumors. And I like to sort of lump some of these into this spinal cord compression syndrome is how I usually refer to it in my note that the patient doesn't have any red flags or risk factors for a spinal cord compression syndrome. So those are some of the things that we're going to pay, uh, pay special attention to that we do not want to miss, and there's particular red flags for those. How do we approach this problem? Well, one of the first questions we're going to ask about is whether or not this is traumatic related. Someone coming in after a car accident, that's pretty clear cut that they had a clear episode of trauma and that could be causing and is likely to be causing their back pain. But sometimes patients might actually have some sort of vague memory about something that happened, oh, two months ago I had a car accident or I was moving furniture a while ago and now it's just flared up my back pain. That in itself, you should say, mm, I don't know if that's really correlated. You gotta dig a little bit deeper and not just say, oh yeah, it's related to a, a strain or a traumatic injury from way back in the past. We want to be consistent. One thing that's really hard about back pain is that even though you know most patients are going to be fine, you should still run through the same consistent history and exam that you do on every single patient. So that way you know that you're not missing one of those red flags. 
Now, when it comes to trauma, remember that as patients get older, it doesn't take a big mechanism of trauma, right? They don't have to be in a big deceleration MVC with oh, severe back pain. No, they could have had a ground level fall or the feared fall off of the toilet. That minor mechanism can actually cause a fracture or significant injury in an older patient. Pay special attention to the vital signs. I heard Diane's lecture yesterday. Vital signs are very important, especially the temperature. Never ignore an elevated temperature in a patient with back pain. And then any prior history of back pain, just put that in context, right? We don't want to just attribute today's episode of pain with, oh, well, this patient always has back pain that's similar. Uh, how is it different this time? You know, let's, and, and run through your consistent set of history and exam on every patient. All right, circle this slide, highlight it. This is one of the key slides in this whole presentation because this is all about assessing for the red flags, okay? And here's how I like to do it. Um, I like to, I have a smart phrase, a little dot phrase. I type dot back pain and it pulls into my note this little couple of paragraphs that I've written. I put it in my medical decision making, my MDM part of my note and it runs through everything, right? So it, it says something to the effect of patient did not have any of the following on history or exam and then I list out basically these red flags and then some, some more in addition to this. Okay, now I always check to make sure it's, it serves as a reminder for me that I actually did all of those things. I actually checked for all those things. And if I didn't, I'm going to either delete it or go back and talk to the patient, see the patient again. But it serves as a little reminder for me of what those red flags are so that I try not to miss it. And I'll tell you when I created that smart phrase. It was after I missed the first case that I'm aware of where I missed an epidural abscess. And that was when I was like, oh my gosh. I need a little reminder so I don't forget something important but subtle. So the location of the pain, okay? Think about the areas that are the most mobile. Turning your head, right? So in the C-spine, people get neck pain. You're, when you turn, it's actually your lower back that's doing the turning. It's kind of hard to turn your thoracic back because it's connected to all the ribs. So patients who have pain in their thoracic back, that's an uncommon site for pain. That was the site of pain in the patient who I missed who developed an epidural abscess. I say it like there's only one, but there's probably more out there that I just don't know about. And remember, disc-related problems, this is a really common cause of sciatica. So you can get a bulging disc or a herniated disc compressing on the nerve's roots and causing a ridiculous type of pattern of pain. Um, that can radiate down the leg in the case of sciatica, and there's a few more slides on sciatica coming up. Back exam. I'll tell you how I do my back exam. Nothing magical here. But, but the key thing is that this is not an exam that you can realistically accomplish in triage. These patients deserve an actual exam, okay? They deserve to be looked at in an exam room, in a gown. Look at their back. Don't miss the zoster as the cause of back pain because you didn't lift up the patient's shirt. So actually look at their back. Then you're going to palpate going down the spine looking for focal areas of tenderness. Palpate the paraspinal areas. Sometimes I get to a paraspinal muscle and it's like rock hard and it's a very, very tight muscle spasm. And with the right story, I'm like, oh yeah. I can, and as I'm pressing on it, they're like, oh, that feels kind of good. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you have, a, you have a muscle spasm. That's what you have. Someone else can do the massage. <laughs> So actually looking at the patient's back, actually getting them into a gown, right? It's kind of hard to say that you did a really thorough back exam if you didn't actually get them into an exam room and into a gown to do it. So again, it could be so easy when you're at triage and you see someone, you're like, oh my gosh, I know that they're fine. They're walking normal. They look great. Their vitals are normal. No, you're still going to send them back and you're still going to do a proper back exam so you don't miss the epidural abscess like I did. Sciatica is something we're going to see all the time. You guys see this all the time, right? That's like actually one of the really common, when you, when you put your final diagnosis in the chart, which is usually back pain. Oh, just revolutionary doctor. Thank you so much for diagnosing me with my chief complaint. But back pain is often the diagnosis that we put in our chart. And then the ICD-10 could say with or without sciatica. Like it's some key differentiating point when we know in reality it's actually not. But what is sciatica? Let's be clear about what we're talking about. So the sciatic nerve, it's branches from L4, L5, S1, 2, and 3, and they all come together, as you can see in the diagram. And if you get compression, you can get it of just some of those nerve roots or all of them. 
and it's going to cause a pretty uh, consistent syndrome here. You can get this sharp shooting pain. Patients will often say it radiates all the way down their leg sometimes. They can even get some unilateral weakness or numbness, but it has to be unilateral weakness or numbness. Unilateral is the key. You're not allowed to have bilateral, okay? Because if it's affecting both sides, that's not just one nerve root that's getting compressed. You've got to think about something compressing centrally. That's a patient who deserves a workup and deserves imaging. So it has to be unilateral. Some physical exam movers that, maneuvers that help you um, reach this diagnosis of sciatica. The straight leg raise test. So the patient's lying supine. It's the, let's say their left leg that hurts. You, you keep their knee straight and you lift up the left leg and they, ah! That reproduces the pain. It shoots right down their leg. So that's a pretty sensitive test. It's not very specific. But then what you can do is you can lift up the other leg, the unaffected leg, and now you do the same exact thing, but now it's the crossed straight leg raise test. And when you lift up that leg and ow, the pain shoots and reproduces right down the left side, that's more specific for diagnosing sciatica. So this helps you. This is helping you, right? We're still not going to ignore the red flags. If they still have other red flags, we're still going to do more workup. But if everything seems consistent with sciatica, you don't have to pursue a big workup with labs and imaging, and you can just go ahead and make your conservative management recommendations for follow-up. Okay, so these next couple of slides are a little reminder of some of the nerve roots and what they innervate. Where's the sensation, motor, reflexes that correspond to these nerve roots? And this should be part of your back exam every single time. So you're looking, you're palpating, and then you're doing a lower extremity exam on everyone. And part of my routine on every back pain patient is to have them walk. If you can't walk, you can't walk out of the emergency department. But you want to get a global assessment of how much like, global function is lost here. Are they really, really limping along? Are they dragging a foot? Right? So walking gait test, I think, is really important in patients with back pain. And then I'll tell you a couple other things that I do in every back pain patient, and I teach my residents to do this. The heel and toe walk. Okay, so you've had the patient take a couple of steps to see how they're walking. Now, if the patient can stand up on their heels and even walk a couple steps on their heels, what does that tell me? It tells me that they are intact all the way down to L4, L5, to be able to do that, right? To dorsiflex. And then to hold that, to walk a couple steps like that, to heel walk, they're intact down to L5. And if they can toe walk, now I know they can plantar flex with good strength. And that's all the way down to S1. So heel walk, toe walk, I know they're intact all the way down to S1. From a sensation perspective, there's the dermatomes, right? And they have this kind of crazy diagonal pattern that goes across the body. Well, there's one area where it's very easy for me to remember, and so I like it, and that's at the knee. At the knee, medially, is L3. Over the kneecap, the patella, that's L4. Laterally is L5. So it, rather than just saying, can you feel this, and you're just touching some random part of the leg, you can specifically test L3, 4, and 5 at the knee. How easy is that? Can you feel here, here, and here? Great, intact. And if you want to get S1, you go down to the pinky toe. So quick and easy to accurately assess sensation and motor of the lower extremities. Quick check around the knee, the lateral foot, heel walk, toe walk. That, I think, is a pretty good thorough exam. And some patients are going to need a rectal exam if you're concerned. Some patients are going to need other tests as well. But just doing that, it gives you a pretty good global assessment. There's that crazy diagonal pattern of the dermatomes, but if you zoom in right there onto the knee, you can see that's a really good spot where you can hit multiple nerves that go all the way down. Piriformis syndrome. There's a couple of slides in here of sort of fun little weird diagnoses where it's basically a nerve getting irritated in a variety of ways. So piriformis syndrome, the piriformis muscle, this is the ballerina muscle because it allows you, I'm not a ballerina, but it allows you to rotate your leg outward. Okay, so you think of the ballerinas. I think that's called first position, is that right? Anyone, any dancers out there? You're engaging your piriformis muscle to be able to rotate your leg outwards. 
And in some people, the sciatic nerve runs through the piriformis muscle. And so if you get inflammation of that muscle, then it can sort of cause a sciatica type of syndrome. In that case, it's called a piriformis syndrome. So these patients are going to have increased pain with sitting, lying, or standing, and the pain decreases with walking. They can also have tenderness of the buttock right over the area of the piriformis muscle. And the treatment for this is rest. Vertebral fractures, this is something we don't want to miss. Um, and think about patients who sustain an axial load, especially with flexion. So you're driving in the car, and you get into a car crash, and you suddenly decelerate and crunch forward. That crunching motion, imagine my vertebrae, right, my vertebral bodies, getting crushed, getting sandwiched in as you suddenly crunch forward. That's one of the common mechanisms. The other one that I see is someone who jumps off of a balcony, for example, sudden crush down on their vertebral column. In younger patients, it's usually a more of a significant trauma, but remember, in older patients, it does not take as much force to cause a vertebral fracture. And if you find one, so this is, you're going down the midline of the spine looking for areas of tenderness and in the right setting of trauma, that should be a red flag that you're going to get imaging of the spine. And what kind of imaging are you gonna get? Hopefully you have access to a CT scanner because with the exception of only a couple specific patterns of fractures, x-rays just have way too high of a miss rate. For me, it's sort of unacceptably low in most cases. I don't order a lot of x-rays of the back. If you're worried enough that you're gonna get imaging, you might as well get something that has a high enough sensitivity to detect the fractures. And if you find one fracture, make sure you've imaged the whole spine because there tends to be other non-contiguous fractures, right? So we wanna get, if, you're, if you find one, go ahead and image the whole spine. These tend to be stable fractures, and these tend to be the ones that when you call the neurosurgeon, you know, these poor patients are in the emergency department for many, many hours while they're getting their upright films in their brace to make sure that the compression fracture it maintains its height. But they can be unstable, especially if it's a burst fracture and there's a loss of height of more than 50%. So these are patients, when you identify that fracture, you're getting your neurosurgeon or your orthopedic surgeon involved. Here's an example of what a vertebral compression fracture looks like. This is one that you actually can see fairly well on a plane film, but look at that beautiful, that healthy spine on that plane film. This is a young patient with a compression fracture. So it's easier to see on a young, healthy spine. So again, this is one of the niche uses of X-ray, but again, CT scan, way more sensitive for looking at fractures. Spinal stenosis. This is something that's more common as people get older, and it's caused by facet hypertrophy and thickening of the ligamentum flavum. The ligamentum flavum is that one ligament, you know when you're doing an LP, and you go through the spinous processes, and you're like, ooh, something's crunchy right there. That's the ligamentum flavum. So once it's calcified and crunchy and thick enough, it can start causing compression onto the spinal cord. And it causes a pseudoclotication syndrome with tingling down the legs and pain, especially with walking. This is one of those cases where it's like the, the older person pushing the shopping cart. Uh, finally, it feels a little bit better when you're flexing forward or sitting forward and kind of leaning on something. That's one thing that makes it feel a little bit better. Spinal stenosis tends to not get better just on its own. In many patients, it just continues to be painful or it gets worse, and they need close follow-up. Primary care, maybe orthopedics or neurosurgery, and sometimes they actually do intervene and offer some sort of operation for patients with worsening spinal stenosis and neurodeficit. So I do like to involve the consultants um, when this diagnosis is made. And it's made with a CT or an MRI. Here on this image, you can see how that spinal canal is getting more and more narrow and how those joints, uh, the facet joints and the ligamentum flavum can kind of encroach upon the spinal canal. And here's an example of this. This is an MRI. And you can, I mean, it, you don't have to be a radiologist to look at this and know something's not normal there. I mean, look down at that uh, upper T-spine. That looks like pretty normal, healthy vertebral column and, and spinal cord but there's something going on. It's like, well, if you're not an expert, you might say, well, what is that? Is that an infection? What's going on here? Well, it's arthritis, degenerative disc disease, calcification, and spinal stenosis crunching down. You see it getting smushed? You see the spinal cord getting smushed up in the C-spine on this image? Spondylolisthesis. Listhesis, slipping, a listhesis. So this is an anterior slippage 
of one vertebral body over the top of another. Um, it can, this is one thing that you can see in kids. And this is one thing that's thought to be due to these recurrent hyperextension. So think about this in your gymnast, and your weightlifter, your dancers, your cheerleaders. And I should say, speaking of like cheerleaders and dancers and things that we, you know, we tend to think of in our pediatric patients, how many kids do you see who get brought to the ER with back pain? Like any? Like think about the last 100 people you saw who came to the ER with back pain and how many of them were kids. Probably none of them, right? It's not something we see in kids. So a child with back pain severe enough to be brought to the emergency department deserves special attention. Be, be particularly concerned about kids with severe back pain. And this is one of the things on the differential. So here, this slide just basically points out the difference between spondylosis and spondylolisthesis because they sound so similar. Who is responsible for naming them? They're fired. Spondylosis, that's just degenerative changes. Spondylolisthesis, listhesis, slipping of one vertebral body over another one. And you can see it here. You can tell this is probably a young patient because look how healthy that spine looks. But here we have L5 slipping over the top of S1. That's the most common site where this happens. Moralgia parasthetica, changing gears again. This is another one of those sort of interesting sort of uh, uh, nerve compressions. So it's kind of similar in my mind to piriformis syndrome. Now we're talking about the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve innervates down the lateral thigh. Um, and so what you can get is this syndrome where as, as the nerve crosses from, it, it crosses between the iliac and under the inguinal canal, and you can get compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and it causes this sort of uh, shooting pain or numbness just down the lateral thigh. So right over that area, think about the inguinal crease, ingu inguinal canal, what could compress that? What would be a big thing right here that's compressing at the inguinal crease? Maybe a pregnant belly, maybe a beer belly, a belly of any kind, or a workman's belt. So the treatment here is to treat the underlying cause. Try telling that to your pregnant patients. Yeah, just deliver the baby, be fine. Or the treatment's NSAIDs unless you're pregnant. Or if, it, if it's just really due to being overweight, I know uh, patients really don't like hearing that. Oh, another thing due to being overweight. But the treatment is to address the underlying cause, NSAIDs, anything that we can alleviate that pressure that's putting over where that nerve crosses is going to alleviate that pain of neuralgia parasthetica. Okay, another red flag slide. This is red flags for cancer. Now we're on to the things you really don't want to miss. Okay, anyone who has a prior history of cancer, and there are certain ones that tend to go to bone more than others. Lung, breast, and prostate even a remote history of these types of cancers, be on the alert for these. Unexplained weight loss, age over 50 or under 17. No particular inciting event, or like I said earlier, something that just doesn't really make sense. Oh, two weeks ago I lifted a couch. Yeah, that doesn't really make sense why you're acutely having pain today. Or the pain's not getting better with conservative treatment. It's lasting a long time. Pain at night, pain at rest, these are red flags for cancer. These patients, at some point, deserve imaging. Whether or not it's today in your emergency department depends, but at some point, they deserve imaging. Red flags for infection. These are other things. Drop them into your smart phrase if you're going to create one. Don't ignore a fever. Persistent fever. History of IV drug abuse. This is one of the things that I had missed on my patient. It also was a good reminder that very normal-looking people can also be IV drug users. This particular patient, uh, he was seen by an off-service resident. I was running around, my hair was on fire that day, it was very busy in the emergency department, and someone presented this patient to me and I had about two minutes to see them before running off to the next thing. I go in and I see a very well-appearing patient. He says, yeah, I have a little bit of pain up here. When I cough, it seems to make it a little bit, of, a little bit worse. He had normal vital signs, he looked well, no neuro deficits, sent him home. Didn't ask about IV drug use. Forgot to ask about that. About a week later, I got that email from a friend. Hey, Jess, remember that patient you saw a week ago? We love how that conversation starts, right? <laughs> well, I had forgotten to ask about IV drug abuse, and he was brewing an epidural abscess. Other things that are red flags for infection. Have they had 
another infection recently, a UTI. Maybe they became bacteremic and now exceeded and caused a discitis or osteomyelitis of the spine. Are they immunosuppressed, including diabetics, including people who are on steroids for some reason? Specific red flags for spinal epidural abscess. So this is an insidious process. It's usually not something that occurs very suddenly. It tends to be insidious. And that was the case in my patient, right? It's brewing and simmering, and then eventually it gets to the point where there are neurodeficits, and they are febrile, and they have abnormal vital signs. But sometimes it takes a few days to get to that point. <clears throat> and thoracic back pain in particular, this, was, this is where I missed it on my patient, that in itself is a red flag. Okay, it's not just the lower back. When patients have these red flags, now we're getting some labs. We're doing some workup. What labs are helpful? CBC, okay, maybe, maybe helpful. I know that my consultants are definitely gonna want it. ESR and CRP, these inflammatory markers, these, when they're elevated, they tend to be associated with infections. And so these are labs that we should get and they're helpful and our consultants want them. And the imaging study of choice is an MRI, an MRI not a CT scan. CT is good for looking at bones, the MRI is gonna be better at looking at soft tissue and the spinal cord. Here's a couple of examples uh, of what this looks like. One of these images is a discitis that has progressed to now cause an epidural abscess. And then the image on the right is just the osteomyelitis with an epidural abscess. So you can see something that looks kind of gnarly in the vertebral uh, body and then sort of what's going on? I see a nice clear picture of the spinal cord and then it gets really muddy looking and sort of disappears. Well, that, that looks infectious. You see that, you don't even need to wait for the read. You can go ahead and get on the phone with your consultant and let them know your concern. Red flags for cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome, now we're talking about where the spinal cord ends, usually L1, L2, and it branches off into just the nerve roots. So the horse's tail, cauda equina. Anything that's gonna compress at this level is a cauda equina syndrome. It's not necessarily just epidural abscesses. So this is why we ask about bowel and bladder incontinence. And how do we get that urinary incontinence? Well, it's actually an overflow incontinence. It starts with urinary retention. And that's why getting a post-void residual scan, bladder scan, is a good test for someone who you're worried about for a possible cauda equina syndrome. You have the patient void, then either you measure on ultrasound or you have a bladder scanner, measure how much urine is still in the bladder. So post-void residual bladder scan. Once it starts getting over 100 milliliters, then you start to get more concerned. The exact number is not well known. Of course, the higher the number, the more specific it's gonna be. But if it's over 150, 200, now we're worried they actually have urinary retention. And they may get to the point where the bladder's so full, now they have urinary incontinence. Saddle anesthesia. So the area of the saddle, if you, if you ride a horse, the area of the saddle, it's peri anal area. You can have the patients check this themselves when you do the exam. You don't have to do this. You want to do this exam with a chaperone, but you can actually have the patient say, just coach them. Can you touch up in your, your groin area over here? Tell me, does that feel normal to you? I think that's acceptable. And then rectal tone would be decreased on patients with cauda equina syndrome. This is a neurosurgical emergency, and the study of choice is an MRI. Um, steroids, talk to your neurosurgeon about whether or not they want to give steroids. The, the ones that I work with do not. And here you can see on this illustration, L1, L2, the end of the spinal cord, and then the horse's tail of the spinal nerves, nerves coming off from that level and below. So work up maybe some labs, maybe C CBC, ESR, CRP. Um, maybe consider checking a calcium, especially if you're worried about the possibility of cancer. It can be elevated in some patients who have bony metastases. And then the American College of Physicians has a set of guidelines of when to pursue imaging. The short version here is they're gonna support you on being conservative about imaging, okay? We don't have to image everyone. This is why it's all about the red flags. We wanna save imaging for when we really need it, when there are red flags or concerning signs or symptoms present. Otherwise, let's try not to do imaging because CT and MRI in particular, these are expensive. They take a lot of time. They add a long time to the length of stay. And oftentimes, they're not going to change outcomes. They're not going to change management. So most of the time, patients can be discharged home safely in the absence of red flags. 
They can be discharged home safely, follow up with a primary care provider who can monitor if things are getting worse or things are changing, then perhaps let's get imaging at that time. So these next few slides go through these recommendations specifically to support you in being a little more conservative about getting imaging. Okay, treatment. So most patients are gonna go home, okay? If they have something bad, if they have something infectious, you're gonna get on the phone with your consultant, you're probably gonna start some antibiotics. For discitis, they often like you to hold off unless the patient's septic so that they can get in there and actually get a biopsy and see what grows from it. But for epidural abscess and if the patient looks, looks septic, you can start some antibiotics. Most people who are well, who don't have a red flag, they don't have something dangerous, we're sending them home and we're gonna tell them, don't do bed rest, get up and walk, move when you can. You can take acetaminophen, you can take ibuprofen or other NSAIDs. Muscle relaxants, a lot of patients wanna know about muscle relaxants because they've been prescribed it before and because they're called muscle relaxants, but let's be real about what they are, they're sedatives. They don't actually relax the muscles. So if that is something that you wanna prescribe, just be real with your patient, right? This isn't actually gonna relax your muscles, it's just maybe gonna help you sleep at night. And so advise them not to take it during the daytime or if they're gonna be driving. All the other topical treatments, open to trying it, including a lidocaine patch, sure, try it. If it makes you feel better, great. Not a lot of good evidence for them. And then follow-up is very, very important, okay, because we're going to miss patients. You, like me, will miss patients with something bad brewing. But as long as they know they should return if things worsen, see their primary doctor or come back to the emergency department, that's how we hopefully aren't going to miss them. 